And one of those is that attacking civilian targets is really, really stupid. It's not just immoral behavior, it's actually counterproductive. And this happens to be true whether you're a non-state actor or a government. Dr. Abrams is among the world's leading experts on the subject of terrorism. Currently, he's a professor of political science at Northeastern University and a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. Abrams is also a frequent analyst in the media, especially on the consequences of terrorism, its motives, and the implications for counterterrorism strategy. He regularly briefs government agencies, including the CIA, National Intelligence Council, National Counterterrorism Center, and Department of Homeland Security. Imagine you have a grievance a really bad grievance against the government. Maybe you're a Rohingya husband in Myanmar whose wife was just gang raped by security goons and you need the ethnic cleansing to stop. To stop. Maybe you're a Venezuelan mother who can't feed her kids because the president has enacted cruel economic policies and barred opposition candidates from contesting them. Maybe you're a homeless child in Bahrain because your family comes from the oppressed Shia majority. Maybe the British government is after you because you're an unrepentant right-wing extremist who doesn't think Muslims belong. Or maybe you're a Sunni engineer living in Nice or Orlando or Sydney or Dhaka yearning for a caliphate. Whatever your grievance, real or imagined, respectable or repugnant, it exceeds your capacity to redress it. After all, if you and your crew were stronger, you wouldn't be opposing the government. With any luck, you'd be leading it. Not surprisingly then, the history of the aggrieved is a story about failure. But not always. I've just published a book showing how aggrieved groups can overcome this power asymmetry against the government to achieve their political demands. My title, Rules for Rebels, is inspired by Saul Alinsky's classic, Rules for Radicals. In his 1971 primer for the have-nots, the father of modern community organizing shared lessons he had learned over the years for successful protest. But the problem with rules for radicals is that protesters often conclude that protesting isn't enough. Historically, many groups have escalated to violence after nonviolence failed. Michael Collins, for example, concluded in the early 20th century that the Brits would continue to ignore his pleas for Irish independence unless the revolutionaries escalated with violence. Menachem Begin and other Zionist leaders reached the same conclusion in the 1940s that the Brits would continue to occupy Palestine unless the Yishuv turned to violence. Algerian nationalists said essentially the same thing in the 1950s, that they too turned to violence only after the French had ignored their protests to end the occupation. In the 1960s, South African activists like Nelson Mandela also prescribed violence after concluding that his protests alone weren't about to end the apartheid. More recently, accounts of Syrian rebels suggest many of them also picked up weapons as a last resort. The truth is that, like it or not, some radicals will become rebels, and there are rules for them too. Rules for rebels starts where rules for radicals ends. It analyzes hundreds of militant groups from all over the world to discern why some succeed and others fail. I come with welcome news for the rebel leader. My research reveals he possesses a surprising amount of agency over his political destiny. Triumph is possible, but only for those who know what to do. It turns out there's a science to victory in militant history, but even rebels must follow rules. My rules for rebels may seem counterintuitive, but they're based on original insights from many academic disciplines, especially political science, psychology, criminology, economics, management, marketing, 
communications, and sociology, and then tested with a bunch of different methodological approaches from detailed qualitative case studies to large end regression analysis to content analysis to network analysis, even some survey experiments. The key takeaway is that smart militant leaders aren't always successful, but successful leaders must be smart. Islamic State may come to mind when you think of a successful militant group led by a smart leader. Clad in black robes, ISIS leader Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi ascended the pulpit of the Great Al-Nuri Mosque in the Iraqi city of Mosul on July 5th, 2014, proclaiming the emergence of a new caliphate. In his Friday sermon, the self-professed caliph announced to the Ummah that his foot soldiers had just succeeded in capturing swaths of land in Iraq and Syria, effectively creating an Islamic state. By year's end, ISIS would control a third of Iraq and Syria, landmass roughly equal to the size of Great Britain, where the terrorists ruled over nine million people. The Islamic State was bolstered by the largest influx of international jihadis in history. Over 40,000 foreign fighters from 110 countries headed to Syria and Iraq, more than four times the number of Mujahideen who had traveled to Afghanistan in the 1980s to battle the Red Army. ISIS's reach was hardly limited to the caliphate. Scores of ISIS attacks in dozens of countries terrorized the world. By 2016, Baghdadi had accepted the allegiance of 43 terrorist group affiliates, from Boko Haram in Nigeria to Abu Sayyaf in the Philippines. Now they were all fighting under the black banner. Not only did ISIS have territory and fighters, but it raked in over a billion dollars a year in oil sales, taxes, smuggling, looting, and hostage taking. The international media was quick to crown Islamic State leaders as masterminds. In a story entitled, Military Skill and Terrorist Technique Fuel Success of ISIS, the New York Times gushed that the group's battlefield successes are due to the pedigree of its leadership. The story concluded, these guys know the terrorism business inside and out. The Guardian also credited ISIS's apparent feats to highly intelligent leaders calling the shots. The Financial Times proclaimed, ISIS is chillingly smart. If ever there were a smart strategic militant group, Islamic State was apparently it. This conventional wisdom in the media was fueled by think tank pundits who proclaimed ISIS leaders as strategic geniuses in three main ways. First, ISIS leaders were allegedly smart to recognize the strategic value of brutalizing civilians, not only in its stronghold of Iraq and Syria, but in indiscriminate massacres around the world. In a Politico article entitled, How ISIS Out-Terrorized Bin Laden, Will McCants of the Brookings Institute explained that ISIS has been remarkably successful at recruiting fighters, capturing land, subduing its subjects, and creating a state why? Because violence and gore work. We're told that this terrifying approach to state building has an impressive track record. His Brookings hallmate, Shadi Hamid, shared this assessment in a book and countless media interviews that the shooting rampage at the Bataclan Theater and the bombing of the Russian passenger jet over the Sinai were, as he put it, smart moves because Instilling terror in the hearts of your opponents undermines their morale, making them more likely to stand down, flee, or surrender. And the willingness to inflict terrible violence has a deterrent effect, raising the cost for anyone who so much as thinks of challenging the group. In their bestseller on ISIS, Michael Weiss and Hassan Hassan repeat that the group's notorious brutality helped it. In countless media interviews, they said that the head chopping and cage burning of hapless victims follows a brutal logic and indeed showcases the evil genius of ISIS. Clearly, pundits have been impressed with how the ISIS leadership sanctions a policy of unbridled barbarism. Second, pundits commended how the ISIS leadership generated so much bloodletting largely by decentralizing the organization. 
the ISIS leadership takes a hands-off approach, beckoning fanatics across the globe to butcher people of their choosing in the group's name. According to Clint Watts of the Foreign Policy Research Institute, the key to ISIS's gains is that the leadership recognizes the benefits of diffuse operational control, which grants extremists the autonomy to plot and plan locally. Peter Bergen of the New America Foundation also credited the apparent success of ISIS to its diffuse organizational structure. What empowers ISIS, he wrote for CNN.com, is it accepts all comers, encouraging fanatics across the globe to carry out attacks anywhere they'd like. The brilliance of the ISIS system, echoed MSNBC terrorism commentator Malcolm Nance, is that its recruitment system is almost passive. Baghdadi invites every nutcase to the global massacre. Baghdadi welcomes them all. The leaders could never have inflicted so much carnage on their own, but they were allegedly wise enough to expand the bloodbath by decentralizing ISIS operations and recruitment. Third, pundits applauded the ISIS strategy of broadcasting its misdeeds in lurid detail over social media platforms like Twitter and Facebook. ISIS has used social media to showcase its innovative sentencing styles, from beheadings with a knife, to decapitation through explosive detonation cord, to death by dragging, drowning, stoning, burial, roof chucking, and squashing, sometimes with a tank. Philip Smythe of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy affirms that ISIS succeeded by cultivating the perfect sociopathic image. Charlie Winter and Colin Clark of RAND agree that Islamic State's propaganda truly has been unmatched, not only in terms of the quality of its output, but in its quantity too. Charles Lister of the Middle East Institute says that these jihadists in particular proved especially adept at managing their use of social media and the production of qualitatively superior video and imagery output. And yet, Something unforeseen by these terrorism talking heads happened. ISIS's beloved caliphate died just as quickly as it had appeared. Think tank pundits had been too busy glorifying the group's strategy to realize it was a bust. The green in this map is where ISIS lost territory and the red is where ISIS held on to territory. Though of course, even these slices are now basically gone. In fact, the caliphate got smaller every year until it all but vanished. In 2015, ISIS lost 40% of Iraq and 20% of Syria. In 2016, ISIS lost another quarter of its land. By spring 2017, ISIS controlled less than 7% of Iraq and was getting vanquished in Syria by the Syrian Arab army, its Shia militia partners, American and Russian air power, Kurdish warriors, and a smattering of other militants called the SDF. Tellingly, in June 2017, ISIS blew up the Al-Nuri Mosque, the very site where the caliphate had been declared. A few weeks later, from the ruins of al-Nuri, the Iraqi military spokesman faced no ISIS opposition whatsoever when he declared their fictitious state had fallen. Even the fanboys in, on pro-ISIS chat rooms conceded the caliphate project was a complete failure. Although ISIS's raison d'etre of an Islamic state went up in smoke, there was a clear winner, its arch enemies. The Salafists repeatedly said that ISIS was intended to curb the influence of Iran and its Shia proxies, especially Hezbollah. But instead of becoming the seat of a hardline Sunni state, Iraq and Syria turned into Shia country. The Islamic State project faceplanted by its very own standard. The terrorists were, as Trump once called them, evil losers. But who could have predicted this stunning reversal of fortune? Well, I did from day one. If you had the misfortune of following me on Twitter, you'd know that I was always a fierce skeptic of the ISIS conventional wisdom. From the moment Baghdadi declared a caliphate in 2014, I gave hundreds of media interviews from the Associated Press to the BBC, pointing out the basic analytical problem. 
the very behaviors lauded by pundits as strategic have historically doomed militant groups. ISIS, I charge, would be no exception. With a little historical context and methods training, it was obvious to me Baghdadi was no mastermind, and neither were his fellow strategists. They were, as you'll see, supremely stupid terrorists. President Obama got hammered in the media for saying early on that ISIS was the JV team of terrorists, but he was right, at least when it comes to their cluelessness about devising a winning political strategy. Smart militant leaders follow three simple rules for victory, the exact opposite of what ISIS leaders have done. First, smart leaders recognize that not all violence is equal for achieving their stated political goals. In fact, they grasp that some attacks should be carefully avoided because they're deeply counterproductive for the cause. My research is the first to empirically demonstrate that there's variation in the political utility of attacks depending on the target. Compared to more selective violence against military and other government targets, indiscriminate violence against civilian targets is counterproductive. So the first thing that smart militant leaders do is recognize that civilian attacks are a recipe for political failure. You might say that the first rule for rebels is for leaders to learn not to use terrorism at all. There's no consensus over the definition of terrorism, but most scholars define it as attacks against civilian targets in particular. When we talk about terrorism, we mean civilian attacks, like against schools, markets, soccer games, rock concerts, commercial airplanes, churches, synagogues, mosques, we're not talking about blowing the treads off of a tank. What matters for the rebel leader, though, isn't how we define terrorism, but that he understands the folly of harming civilians. Leaders may not initially grasp the risk of terrorism, but the smart ones learn it over time. Without internalizing this rule, they can't be expected to follow the other ones and prevail. The second rule is for the leader to actively restrain lower level members from committing terrorism. It doesn't matter whether the leader understands the futility of, of terrorism if his members continue to do it. The key is for the leader to structure the organization to restrain his members from using terrorism. In practice, this means centralizing the organization so he can educate fighters to avoid civilians, discipline fighters who harm civilians, and vet out prospective members who seem prone to attacking civilians. Whereas the first rule is for the leader to recognize the value of civilian restraint, the second rule is for getting his members to abide. And the third rule is what to do when they don't. For the rebel leader, the key is to make the group look moderate, even when his members act otherwise. This means protecting the brand by denying organizational involvement, or at least intent, whenever wayward operatives harm civilians. These three simple rules for rebels, learning to win, restraining to win, and denying to win are the secrets for victory. Long before ISIS inverted this playbook, smart militant leaders were following it. They're the ones nodding their heads from parliaments, not spikes. Thanks very much. I, I really have two versions of this talk. The first is um, just for the general smart public like this one. And then the book is actually delves really deep into the political science. That's why it's a 300 page book. What I've essentially done is I've outlined um, my thesis. And the book is then very cleanly divided into three parts. The first part demonstrates with all sorts of different social scientific techniques, basically the veracity of rule one. The second part is for rule two. And the third part is for rule three. Um, and so I'm happy to take uh, any question that you guys want about my argument, about the book, or, or, or anything that might pop to your mind more generally uh, about terrorism. I teach uh, 
a lot of courses on terrorism at uh, Northeastern University, so you don't need to adhere closely to my argument if you have a, a more general question. But luckily, I also um, have the slides as well, um, where uh, I can maybe refer you to some of the evidence in the book to elucidate um, basically why I'm confident that if militant leaders follow uh, rules one, two, and three, the odds of their political success are significantly and substantially much, much higher. So uh, with that, I'll take uh, some questions. Do you think that there are any leaders now who are following these rules, uh, who are going to get what they want and who are not? That's a great question. So let me begin by talking about some historical successes so people kind of understand um, why my data works out the way that it does. And then I'll get into some contemporary examples. The short answer for you is yes. Um, so when you look, when you look at uh, terrorism scholars talking about uh, you know, some big terrorist successes, it's interesting to look closely at these groups to try to see what is it that they do. And one thing that I noticed is that the, the main groups that are listed are the Ergun, which succeeded in pressuring the Brits from Palestine, enabling the creation of the Israeli state. The African National Congress, which succeeded in pressuring South Africa to end the apartheid. And Hezbollah, which succeeded in repelling Israel as well as the US and French out of southern Lebanon. When you look closely at these groups though, what you realize is that their political successes didn't come from attacking civilian targets, which succeeded in coercing that government into making the concessions. Uh, the ANC, for example, the African National Congress under Nelson Mandela, they were very, very deliberate in their targeting strategy. What they wanted to do more was sabotage. Uh, if you look at basically the code of conduct and the targeting instructions from the leadership, Mandela didn't say, go attack absolutely any target that you want. The more civilian bloodshed, the better. On the contrary, he was very, very specific not to avoid, uh, to avo uh, yeah, to avoid civilian targets. He issued warnings when civilians might be harmed. Um, and he basically said, attack railroads, attack government targets. So he definitely understood the first rule. Uh, he also understood the second rule in terms of how to structure the organization. As everybody here knows, he wasn't uh, a free man his entire life. When he was put in prison, naturally, his power ebbed. And when his power ebbed, you saw an empowerment of lower level members of the organization who sometimes acted in defiance of his targeting uh, instructions, uh, sometimes blowing up civilians like at the, uh, at the wimpy bar. But when they did that, he wasn't happy. And so he apologized. And so this is rule number three, where the leadership tries to basically uh, limit the amount of terrorism by opposing it, structuring the group to reduce the number, you know, the, the amount that uh, members will attack civilians, and then when it does happen, to try to distance the organization um, by you know, apologizing for it and saying that wasn't our goal. Uh, Hezbollah does the same thing, and actually Ergun did the same thing as well. In fact, Nelson Mandela uh, basically attributes uh, some of his strategies to Menachem Begin. Um, one of the main forms of research I did in the book wasn't just data analysis, although that was a big part of it. I read every single, basically, terrorist autobiography I could get my hands on to try to really get into the minds of the leaders of these militant groups. Um, so turning to contemporary examples, I see now uh, a lot of learning out of Palestinian groups. Uh, pa Palestinian terrorism hasn't remained constant. It has changed over time. Uh, so beginning right around 2000, well, certainly in the 1990s, but definitely in 2000, the more secular Palestinian groups were saying, 
look like we need to change our tactics. Uh, blowing up Egged buses and Sbarros, this is not serving the Palestinian cause. We need to act in a more restrained way because when we use violence, it basically gives Israel a freer hand to crack down on us and it makes us look like bad guys. Now, this sort of uh, lesson um, hasn't, has not been internalized across the board among all Palestinian factions. I don't mean to suggest that um, all the Palestinian groups have received this, like, th th this lesson about the benefits of moderation, but even some of the more extreme elements like Hamas, whether they admit it or not, they are in fact beginning not entirely, but they are beginning to exhibit signs of having learned some lessons about the political perils of um, using violence in too much of a ghastly fashion. So you're much more likely to see Hamas members now uh, basically direct uh, Palestinian protesters to mass along the Gaza border rather than you are to see them sponsoring attacks against Israeli schools. I'm not saying that all Hamas members have gotten this message, but in general, they're more, I, I do see some recognition that slightly less extreme tactics are beneficial for the Palestinian cause. Um, there are many, many other examples. For example, in Syria, for example, uh, the Free Syrian Army, uh, even uh, Nusra. Now, these are not um, moderate groups in the sense that I would recommend for the international community necessarily to support them, but they are moderate when you compare them to Islamic State, for example. Uh, when you look at the Free Syrian Army's code of conduct, the leadership tells its members not to attack civilians. Check it out. Over, it's in the book. Over and over again, the leader actually tells the members not to attack civilians. Now, this isn't always faithfully carried out, but it is actually the message consistently from the leadership. Um, and so we even see this with, uh, with Nusra, uh, which is the, uh, the Al-Qaeda affiliate in Syria. Again, I wouldn't describe this group as a moderate group in the sense that I would recommend for the international community to support them, but tactically, they are very moderate relative to Islamic State, for example. So there was a case when Nusra guys uh, shot dead 20 Druze villagers. The Druze villagers did absolutely nothing wrong. And the leadership recognized that this was counterproductive for the rebel cause. It would make it easier for the international community to recognize the rebels as extremists, right? And so the leadership was actually very furious with its subordinates for having gone too far. And so it issued a big public apology um, and reprimanded um, those Nusra fighters and said, you guys are idiots, what the hell are you doing? We're trying not to look like ISIS here. Um, and you could see the benefits of these groups of basically positioning themselves as relatively moderate compared to ISIS. So the international community focused excessively on ISIS. We heard everything about ISIS, but take a look at what's going on in Raqqa and compare that to Idlib. In Raqqa, which was the ISIS stronghold, it's basically ISIS free. ISIS has been attrited down. There are relatively few ISIS members, not just compared to the number it started with, but compared to groups that were smarter, compared to groups that did a better job of following the rules for rebels, if you will. Uh, Idlib and Afrin and, are, are basically teeming with militants. The international community doesn't really focus on them that much, not in the United States, um, but they have tens of thousands of members and they're much, much stronger than ISIS. They have supporters locally, in terms of the local population, in, the, in a way that ISIS never had. They work together. There's inter-rebel group cooperation in the sense that ISIS never had. There's international support for these groups in a way that ISIS never had. The Sunni Gulf countries, uh, Jordan, Turkey, 
Uh, heck, even the United States was supporting the rebels. And so groups that are more moderate do better. And one of the main reasons why is because they tend to generate more support. And it can be very hard to recognize that because the media tends to, fo to focus only on the most extreme groups. Uh, there's an expression, if it bleeds, it leads. And so every last example of an individual looking at a Jihadi John video and becoming radicalized and traveling to Turkey and getting into the caliphate, every known example that the media found out about was a huge news story. Unfortunately, this created the false impression that using a lot of violence is advantageous for militant groups. One could get the impression that if you use a ton of violence and you chop off people's heads and you make videos about it, then your group will just continue to grow. But really what the media was doing was it was focusing narrowly, exclusively, on what I call the recruitment effect of violence. There's no question that that terrorism can have a recruitment effect. If you're a complete sociopath and you're looking to join up with like the most radical, bloodthirsty, unrestrained, morally reprehensible group, then yeah, that kind of violence serves as an effective form of advertisement. But honestly, there really aren't that many people in the world like that. There's a real finite pool to draw upon like that. At a certain point, they are going to run out. What the media should have done is it should have focused not exclusively on the recruitment effect, but what I also call the attrition effect. The heavy, heavy use of violence and the bragging about it over social media serves not just to attract a limited number of psychos, but it also ends up attriting the group. It's no coincidence that in response to the Islamic State, the whole world banded together and formed the largest international uh, counterterrorism coalition ever assembled. Fighting ISIS became the one thing that almost every country in the world could agree upon. Despite all the differences today, you know, between the United States and Russia, Saudi Arabia and Iran, Hating ISIS was something that actually we could all find a lot of common ground with. And so uh, very, very soon into the creation of ISIS, the attrition rate was actually exceeding the recruitment rate. And I was basically banging my head trying to get some attention sharing this message. Um, but I really didn't have much luck because the media was much more interested in talking about the rise of ISIS and how strong it was getting without recognizing that across all sorts of sort of data-informed indicators, ISIS was actually shooting itself in the foot. The comprehensive uh, analysis of using, I guess, pointed at the violence that says part. Do you have any thoughts on day two, which is I mean, mo most of the conflicts don't start with terrorism. They begin with a political grievance, and then an individual has some friends, and they have some family, and they're very upset, and they may, you know, engage in some kind of protest, some kind of political contestation that falls short of terrorism. Um, this, I mean, there's... It's sometimes said that, to be a real social science nerd, that terrorism is an equifinal phenomenon in the sense that there are many causal pathways to it. Um, some people, they don't have very clear political goals at all. They do not start off as nonviolent protesters. They are not interested in civil resistance. You know, show me what the 19 hijackers were doing before they became hijackers. I don't think they were standing around with, with picket signs. I have no illusions. I don't mean to romanticize these people in any way. But in general, I think it's fair to say that most militant groups um, began, or at least had some sort of a political protest going on um, before they turned to violence. I'm also not advocating for violence in the book. I don't even suggest that the violent route is more effective than the nonviolent route. My point of departure is that, as I tried to explain, like it or not, many of these nonviolent groups, when they continue to toil for a long time without any sort of tangible signs of political progress, 
whether we like it or not, many of them will become violent. And I basically draw, you know, build off of Saul Alinsky's work where he provided some sort of observations he learned from history about the kinds of uh, protests that work. And what I showed is that basically there's wide variation in the political success rates of militant groups. And actually, just analytically, as a matter of fact, different kinds of techniques yield uh, a higher likelihood of a political return. And yet still, I don't want to oversell the book. I mean, it's not as if, you know, some aggrieved group could follow all of the rules. And if they follow all three rules, then they'll have a 100% success rate. What's amazing is that really, that they succeed at all because they're basically starting off with a major, major power asymmetry between the government and basically the aggrieved. And this is why the vast majority of aggrieved people um, end up being on the losing end, except for in really, really thoroughly messed up countries where basically the power capabilities between the government and the groups is a uh, rough parity. Um, two questions, please. One, what will Bashir Assad be up to in the next what happened in Syria really dovetails, I think, well um, with the thesis in the book. When Assad went after ISIS, and I understand that there's a big sort of politicized debate about how much the Syrian Arab army actually went after ISIS, and when they started, you know, when it really went after ISIS. This is a big point of contention on Twitter that I've been arguing for a long time. But when, when the Syrian Arab army went after ISIS, this is something that it's, it's kind of hard to oppose the Syrian military for doing, precisely because ISIS was so extreme. Who in their right mind is gonna openly advocate for not attacking ISIS, right? However, there's wide variation in basically the extremeness of these militant groups, all of which hated Assad. When Assad tried to go after the, 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 more, the relatively moderate groups, that's really when the international community went after him. And they said, you know, you're, uh, you're not attacking ISIS enough, um, you're attacking legitimate freedom fighters, um, basically, he was attacking groups that broadly the international community was in support of. The more moderate the group gets, the harder it was for the Syrian military to credibly attack it. The greater the cost there would be, the audience costs of the world against Assad. So, you know, it was, it was, it was harder for Assad to attack Nusra, the Al-Qaeda affiliate, than it was ISIS. Even harder for Assad to attack Arar al-Sham, you know? Even harder for Assad to attack the Free Syrian Army. As the group gets more and more moderate, the group has more and more international support, and the Syrian government runs more and more into groups which are externally backed by other governments. So once Assad wants to take on the Free Syrian Army, which is relatively moderate compared to many of the other groups, especially ISIS, all of a sudden it runs into Turkey, you know? It runs into Sunni Gulf countries. Um, and so uh, Assad is, would have a very hard problem of basically trying to stamp out the remaining militant groups precisely because they've done a better job of following the rules. Um, so how Assad gets rid of these remaining pockets of relatively moderate militants, this is a, uh, a problem for him. I think that he will never probably be able to get rid of uh, the more moderate militants, if you will. They have too much support on the ground and too much international support, and it would be too costly for him politically to try to go after them. And so he was really forced, I think, to stop um, once ISIS um, became dried up, contra the predictions of the pundit class. Um, well, to finish with the first question, will he then still remain president or hang out in, in his country for the next few years or decade? I would predict yes. His father lasted a really long time. Um, I think that Assad has been underestimated. 
uh, the media, the think tank crowd, you know, was saying that, you know, he was gone, that, you know, he was a dead man walking, that the rebels were, uh, you know, gaining strength against him, that it was just a matter of time before he'd be toppled. Um, and none of that turned out to be true. Um, and Assad's position in Damascus is stronger now than it's been probably since 2012. Um, and I don't, I don't see, you know, regime change, the goal of regime change seems uh, dead. Uh, the, the rebels used to be much stronger. They used to have much more, even more support than they do now. One of the reasons why there was diminished rebel support was precisely because they were exposed as being not so great. They were exposed as being too extreme. It became embarrassing for the United States to support the rebels when basically the weapons were ending up in the, in the arms of Al Qaeda. Um, so the, web, the, the, the rebels have less external support than they used to. A turning point actually happened uh, in the United States, believe it or not, when Donald Trump became president. Uh, Hillary Clinton was a much bigger supporter of the rebels than Trump. Trump campaigned against helping the rebels and he honored his word. He uh, came into office and basically um, said that the rebels were, were bad and that uh, the US was gonna curtail its support of them. This was the direction that we were already going, of course. Obama, too, had basically lost faith in supporting um, the rebels. Um, and then uh, with the United States' you know, reduction of support, Sunni Gulf countries also reduced their support. Jordan reduced its support. Um, so the rebels are, are less supported. Um, furthermore, what's interesting is that uh, the U.S. rhetoric right now, even though um, in some cases it can be really quite extreme, the, the stated goal of the United States is not actually regime change in Damascus anymore. Um, and perhaps most interestingly, this really surprised me. Netanyahu says that the, the stated goal of Israel is not regime change in Damascus either. Israel actually says that it can work with Assad in power, as long as there isn't undue Iranian influence um, on the Israeli border and into Syria. Israel's main focus is to uh, try to attrit Iranian influence in the Levant, but no longer insists on the removal of Assad. So I think that once you have Trump and once you have Israel saying that actually Assad can stay, that's a pretty good indication he's gonna be there for a while. Wow. Yeah, I don't have that much to say. That's a little bit beyond the topic of the book um, in the sense that um, I'm looking at non-state actors in terms of what they need to do in order to maximize the odds of political success. Um, I don't really, um, I, I, I don't offer any direct advice to, to Kim Jong-un. I, I, I will say this though. There are some parallels in terms of the lessons, in terms of lessons that could be extrapolated from non-state actors to governments. And one of those is that attacking civilian targets is really, really stupid. It's not just immoral behavior, it's actually counterproductive. And this happens to be true whether you're a non-state actor or a government. Are there any uh, parallels or lessons for um, other war kind of actors like groups like the CIA and I mean, I would just say that it might not seem like it. You might not get as much media attention for it, but restraint pays. If you use a lot of violence, you are more likely to get more media attention. I don't dispute that. Terrorism, by its very definition, terrorizes. You know, the media covers it. People get afraid. If it didn't do that, it wouldn't be terrorism. Terrorism really took off with the advent of mass media uh, at the turn of the 20th century. Um, and now you can really terrorize with, with social media. So it does attract attention, but it's really not the kind of attention that benefits social movements. Okay.
Yeah, I would, that's a great, that's a great question. It's not entirely obvious in part because there is some dispute, some dispute over how effective the IRA was. In general, I would say the IRA failed politically, that they didn't achieve their main goals. I've, act, I've made that assertion and I've had other academics, for example, uh, Paul Stanlin at the University of Chicago, try to contest me empirically and say, well, actually, I wouldn't code this as a, as a failure, but most people would, people like uh, Richard English. So let's assume that, that the IRA did fail politically, as I believe that they did. An interesting thing is that they did do a pretty good job, actually, of following the rules. There was an evolution over time. Uh, this is captured a bit in the book. Um, the targeting was not completely indiscriminate. Uh, there was an effort, really, to focus on government targets. When civilians were harmed, it wasn't uh, generally intentional. Um, a lot of times, attacks, it might seem like civilians are the intended target because they're the ones that are struck and that's all people really care about. But when you look closely at the attack and in terms of basically the leadership's response, what you see in these smarter groups is that it wasn't in accordance with their instructions and they weren't happy about it and they actually feared that it would be counterproductive. Uh, and so uh, the IRA leadership did try to avoid civilians. It issued warnings, for example, to you know get the heck away from the bomb. It didn't always work. Um, it's hard sometimes to attack, you know, to spear civilians in a militant conflict, even when groups really want to. Um, there are all sorts of control problems that militant leaders have over the rank and file in terms of who they end up attacking, when they pull the trigger, who they shoot, you know? Um, so we see a lot of that in the IRA. Um, and the group uh, really tried to distance itself. Um, so this is a group, I guess this would be an example, in my opinion, of a group that learned, at, at least at the leadership level, to follow, um, I would say, all three rules, really. Um, and yet still, that wasn't enough for them to prevail. Could you uh, speak to the uh, phenomenon of uh, a terrorist attack and the way it's covered by uh, Western media? Um, for example, right, they focus on the attack and the terrorization, uh, for lack of a better word, rather than actually explaining or even right. in any discussion of the political objective or the goal of the group. Right. And, and how does that affect the counterterrorism strategy of that target? Sure. So, in theory, the way terrorism is supposed to work is you have a group that has a political grievance, and it then uses violence, which gets the media's attention in order to amplify the political goals of the group, as well as to signal to the world what the consequences will be if the group doesn't get its political demands. In order to, to signal to the world not only its high motivation to achieve its stated goals, but also its capability to inflict harm if it doesn't achieve its goals. But whereas in theory, terrorism is a political communication strategy, the reason why terrorism has such a bad political return is ironically because terrorism is a terrible communication strategy. Uh, take take, take uh, as an example the 9-11 attacks. Bin Laden was a very loquacious guy. Uh, in the 1990s, he was issuing fatwas. He was laying out what his political grievances were, you know, for uh, the U.S. to withdraw from the Persian Gulf, to stop supporting apostate regimes like Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, to destroy the U.S.-Israeli special relationship, to get the United States to stop killing Muslims around the world. He, he was continuously talking about these things. But then when the 9-11 attacks happened, Americans didn't stop and say to themselves, wow, you know, we should really consult with Osama bin Laden's stated grievances. Let's take a close look about what this guy was so upset about. That was not the way Americans responded. Americans responded 
the way other target countries also respond in the face of terrorism by concluding, you know what? By the very fact that they've used such extreme tactics against us, that renders them extremists. I don't care at all what their stated political goals are. What we need to do is obvious. We need to take the fight to these terrorists and we need to crush them. Um, and so, so terrorism doesn't function as a, as a communication strategy for broadcasting the stated grievances of the group. What it does simply is convince, especially the target country, that by dint of the perpetrator's extreme tactics, that it must just be so extreme also in its political preferences that there's no room to negotiate with these guys and instead our only choice is to pummel them. And so that's why all over the world, countries that are attacked by terrorism tend to respond in a, in a very predictable way. Uh, electorates tend to move to the political right uh, more sort of hardliner politicians tend to gain political support. The executive tends to, tends to gain a freer hand in terms of uh, stomping out the perpetrators. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a very, very uh, predictable cycle, which we can demonstrate actually, not just anecdotally the way I am in this talk, but really statistically. Um, and I do some of this in the book by showing what are you know, the actual you know, statistical effects um, when terrorism is used on a target country. But wasn't didn't Bin Laden want this sort of response from the US because they wanted to bankrupt the country by spending so much against uh, you know, people hanging out the case for the time? Right. So, some people, so there are definitely, you're in good company in, in, in believing that or asking that. There are men, many scholars, uh, prominent scholars of terrorism studies who believe that the main goal of terrorists isn't to force governments into making concessions, but to do the opposite, to get governments to basically overreact, to provoke them into having like a, a crushing response. Uh, people like uh, Barbara Walter, Andrew Kidd, David Lake, uh, uh, Fromkin, uh, yeah, Fromkin. They, they're all believers in this idea that, that the goal is provocation. I personally think that scholars uh, basically uh, exaggerate the prevalence of this strategy among militant groups. Militant groups don't decide to become militants in order, you know, it's their first order of business isn't, let's get the government to crush us. They tend to have a political objective. They want concessions to be made. They use the violence. The response of the government tends to be severe and swift. And then what are militant leaders supposed to say? Ah, we miscalculated. We thought that we were gonna get concessions, but actually the exact opposite happened. All my friends got wiped out. It's generally after the overwhelming response by the government that the militants will say, ah, this is exactly what we wanted all the time. They must say that in order not to look foolish, in order to maintain their members, in order to try to attract new ones. Um, an, an example would be Al-Qaeda. Uh, the vast majority of bin Laden's rhetoric wasn't that the United States was gonna respond in, a, in an overwhelming fashion with Operation Enduring Freedom and provoke the United States and lead it into this big unwinnable war of attrition in Afghanistan. Bin Laden actually said the opposite. He, he used to say that the United States was a paper tiger, that we were wimps, that look at our response in Somalia with Black Hawk Down in 1994. You know, one helicopter went down and we fled Somalia. Look at what happened when Hezbollah attacked us in Lebanon. We fled. He, he basically said that the United States could be struck and, and the United States wouldn't respond in a heavy-handed manner. Then when we did, of course, you know, he said, ah, of course, you know, that's what we wanted all along. Well, if he wanted that all along, why did he take absolutely no precautions for the impending and massive American post-9-11 counterterrorism response? 
Bin Laden was caught flat-footed when we got there. He might, might have said in retrospect, he knew all along that we were going to be there, but nonetheless, we managed to kill off at least 50% of the Al-Qaeda leadership. They were just sitting ducks. If they knew all along that we were going to go in there with such massive force, why didn't they do something about it to protect their most important members? So I'm not a huge believer that the, that the primary goal uh, or that a highly, highly prevalent goal is provocation. I think that that tends to be the result of their behavior, which as a method of coercion for achieving their political aims, seldom works. Thank you so much.